Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance has convened a special grand jury to hear evidence about potential charges against members of the Trump Organization and potentially the Trump family. Reached for comment, the former president said, absolutely, everyone says my juries are the grandest juries anyone has ever seen. Big, beautiful juries, the likes of which no one has ever seen. My juries are at least 100 grand, everyone says. So what is a grand jury in the first place? And is Donald Trump really in trouble this time or what? Well, it kinda. Sponsored by Ting Mobile. Hey Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a district attorney. Now, what are the responsibilities of grand jurors? How much influence does a prosecutor have? And what is the situation for Trump and his employees? Today, we're gonna learn the ins and outs of the grand jury process in New York. But the first question is, how easy is it to indict someone with a grand jury? Well, former New York State Chief Judge Sol Walkler once said the prosecutors had so much control over the grand jury that by and large, they could get them to indict a ham sandwich. Now, this phrase has become shorthand for a prosecutor's ability to get grand juries to do whatever they want. And as we'll discuss later on in this video, that control can go both ways. And ironically, Walkler himself was later indicted for hush money payments to a mistress. But back to the story at hand, what is going on with Trump? Well, the Washington Post reported that a Manhattan grand jury had recently started to meet to review potential charges against the Trump Organization and its principals. Some of this information is not entirely new. Vance's office has been investigating the Trump Organization for about two years. We don't know all of the details, but tax fraud and campaign finance violations are both on the table. Former Trump lawyer Michael Cohen has been interviewed eight times by Vance's office, and Cohen has discussed hush money payments he allegedly made to Trump's mistresses, in addition to providing background on how Trump's businesses were operated. Last year, I did a video about the explosive allegations of Trump tax fraud by the New York Times. Vance's office is believed to be looking at whether Trump or his employees lied about the value of assets to gain favorable loan terms and tax benefits. Vance's investigation got a boost earlier this year after the Supreme Court ruled that Trump had to turn over eight years of tax records. Reports say that these records include both the final and draft version of tax returns, and this information would be central to any determination that Trump himself had criminal liability, especially with regards to his mental state when these financial documents were filed. And as I discussed in the video about Trump's taxes, it's not easy to prove tax fraud. Tax fraud turns on whether the person filing the return knew that they were committing fraud. Powerful people like CEOs and mob bosses are usually pretty savvy about speaking in code and shifting responsibility to others in the hierarchy, like Cohen or CFO of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, for instance. I mean, we don't know what is actually happening inside the Trump Organization at this time. But that's why we should be wary about drawing firm conclusions about whether the grand jury will find evidence that Trump had an intent to commit crimes. But it is a possibility. So the question is, what is this grand jury that's looking at Trump actually doing right now? Well, first we have to start with what is a grand jury? A grand jury is a group of citizens who must decide whether there's enough evidence for a person to be charged with a crime. It's a very different proceeding than the jury trials you're probably used to seeing on TV. So let's start with the difference between a petty jury and a grand jury. A petty jury is convened to decide whether someone has committed a crime or a defendant has civil liability. Petty juries listen to the evidence presented by both parties during a trial and then return a verdict. If a petty jury finds it defendant guilty, then they'll be sentenced typically with a fine, imprisonment, or a combination of both. A petty jury is the jury that you're probably used to seeing on TV. In contrast, a grand jury does not determine someone's guilt or innocence. It also has no involvement in civil cases. This is a purely criminal issue. A grand jury hears evidence presented by a prosecutor. That jury must determine whether there is probable cause to believe that the person or entity has committed a crime. If the grand jury decides that there is probable cause, then it will file a written statement of a charge. This is called an indictment. If the grand jury finds probable cause, then the defendant will be formally charged with a crime and potentially there will be an actual criminal trial to determine their guilt or innocence. Now, this isn't the way that it happens in every case or in every state. Some states use what's called an information, which is basically just an indictment that comes directly from the district attorney with no need for uh, the involvement of a grand jury. But let's talk about New York law. In the New York Constitution, Article 1, Section 6 says that no defendant may be tried for a felony without the case first having been presented to a grand jury. A New York grand jury is composed of between 23 and 16 people. These people are summoned the same way that anyone is for jury duty, with a notice from a county clerk. The jurors usually have to serve a term that ranges from between two weeks and several months, and a special grand jury can meet for up to six months. And since this proceeding doesn't determine someone's guilt, it only determines whether there's probable cause for an 
indictment, you don't have a lot of the safeguards that you would normally have in a full-blown criminal trial. For example, under New York law, there's no judge presiding in the room during the grand jury proceedings. The prosecutor is in charge and is therefore responsible for presenting the government's case and reading the law to the grand jury. This means that Cy Vance's office has two roles. First, presenting evidence as a district attorney for Manhattan and advising the grand jury about process. The DA takes on the role of a judge by advising the jury and ruling on the admissibility of evidence and answering questions. Hopefully the DA will act in good faith, but if he believes that there's probable cause, he's going to present evidence advocating for an indictment. This is why grand juries are so one-sided. So who is in this secretive grand jury room? Well, usually it's the jurors, the prosecutor, and a court reporter. Witnesses are only present during questioning. The defendant and his or her lawyers are generally not present, but we'll get to an exception to that. And when the jury deliberates, the prosecutors and court reporter leave the room. Grand jurors can ask questions, which is something that does doesn't happen during criminal trial proceedings. However, the prosecutor then puts on the judge hat and decides whether the question is relevant. And in a federal grand jury, yes, the federal prosecutors are bound by a similar procedure. The prosecutor is not constrained by the rules of evidence that apply during a criminal trial. But in New York, the prosecutor is bound by the state's rules of evidence with a few noteworthy exceptions which give more leeway for hearsay testimony. If someone is indicted based on hearsay testimony, prosecutors will then have to develop non-hearsay evidence for the criminal case. Now, I know this sounds incredibly one-sided, but remember, there's still a criminal trial yet to happen. This is only deciding about a potential indictment. And traditionally, a potential defendant had no right to testify in his or her defense in front of a grand jury. But defendants in New York do have a right to testify before the grand jury, but this is almost never a good idea because the bar is so low to get an indictment. For example, New York Criminal Procedure Law Section 190.50 provides that a potential defendant must be permitted to testify before a grand jury, but the potential defendant has to sign and submit a waiver of immunity and a waiver of his or her Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And there's very little benefit to testifying before a grand jury. A potential defendant won't know the extent of the government's case against them. And unlike a criminal trial process where the evidence is established well in advance of trial and the prosecutor has an obligation to give that evidence to the defendant, here the person's testimony could tip off the prosecutor about additional evidence and witnesses. And potentially worst of all, the defendant's testimony could also be used in a future criminal trial, meaning that the evidence the person blindly offers during a grand jury proceeding could be highly highly damning and used against them in the future. Believe me, former President Trump does not want to testify before any grand jury, even though, as I'm sure he would say, the testimony would be beautiful, perfect testimony. And perhaps most importantly, at the conclusion of the proceedings, jurors will vote on whether there is probable cause that the potential defendant committed a crime. They vote on whether to return what is called a true bill authorizing prosecutors to indict the defendant. And in a grand jury, prosecutors don't need a unanimous grand jury. An affirmative vote of just 12 grand jurors is enough to authorize an indictment. And if 12 jurors don't believe enough evidence exists to charge a person, then they can return what's called a no bill, which prevents indictment, but that's pretty unlikely. But either way, everything related to the proceeding is supposed to be sealed and secret, which is interesting given that there were leaks that led to the Washington Post reporting that the grand jury exists and is in process. But let's talk about secrecy in these grand jury proceedings. Both state and federal grand juries are conducted in secrecy. The Supreme Court has laid out many reasons for secret proceedings. Number one, it prevents the escape of potential defendants. It ensures that the jurors are not pressured by their friends or threatened with retaliation by potential defendants. It discourages perjury and encourages people to testify without fear. And it protects potential defendants who are not yet indicted from the disclosure that they were investigated for a crime. Under New York law, the prosecutor and jurors are not allowed to reveal anything about the presentation, including testimony or voting. It's a felony to disclose grand jury information. However, the secrecy doesn't extend to witnesses. So the $100,000 question, is an indictment against members of the Trump family imminent? Well, a few words of caution about reports that Donald Trump is about to be indicted. First of all, Donald Trump is potentially not the only target of this probe. He may not even be a target of this probe. Officers of the company, Don Jr. and CFO Alan Weisselberg could be implicated, as could Ivanka or Trump's sisters. 
And of course, in a similarly analogous situation, people overinvested in the Mueller investigation only to be let down when Mueller interpreted his mandate very, very narrowly, saying that he wasn't allowed to say whether Trump committed a crime or not, which is a source of great controversy to this day. And Cy Vance is not exactly Captain America either. In January 2020, advocates called on Vance to resign because of his pattern of allowing wealthy and powerful defendants off the hook. Vance declined to prosecute Harvey Weinstein in 2015. He also uh, allegedly bungled a case against OBGYN Robert Hardin, who allegedly abused dozens of patients. Vance arrested Hardin in 2012, but his arrest was voided and he was allowed to continue practicing. Evelyn Yang, the wife of New York mayoral candidate Andrew Yang, said that she was one of Hardin's victims and she's blasted Vance along with uh, many of the other victims as well. Now, sources didn't exactly say how long the grand jury has been meeting. A special grand jury proceeding lasts for no longer than six months. If recently means they started a few weeks ago, then we could be waiting several months before anything happens. Uh, if we ever see anything at all. If they started to meet five months ago, an indictment or not, might be imminent, though that seems unlikely. However, if you're looking for clues, consider that it was just last week that we learned that New York Attorney General Tish James now has two lawyers working with the Manhattan District Attorney. It's relatively unusual for the Attorney General's office to team up with the local district attorney. They're often turf wars, and apparently that's not happening here. And the revelation came right after James announced that the state's civil investigation of the Trump Organization has evolved into a criminal matter. We don't know why it's criminal, but it may have something to do with evidence that was developed during the ongoing Manhattan grand jury process. But remember, I mentioned that it's often extremely easy to manipulate the grand jury process by prosecutors. That also means that prosecutors can manipulate it in the other direction away from an indictment if that's what they want to do, if they would actually prefer not to indict someone. And we've already seen this in many police cases, such as the case involving the death of Breonna Taylor. Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron is in hot water for allegedly lying about what he presented to a grand jury and allegedly sandbagging his own efforts to procure an indictment uh, in that case. But it certainly looks like Vance wants to indict someone, uh, but we can't assume anything right now, including the identity of that person. Vance announced that he's stepping down at the end of the year, which is kind of a strange move for someone who's about to bring the highest profile case of his entire lifetime. But at the end of the day, if you have personally witnessed illegal activity by the Trump organization or its members, you should call the authorities. And you can save money on that call by switching to Ting Mobile. I personally switched to Ting Mobile and have saved literally hundreds of dollars a month. I'm not kidding here. Why? Because of this. Yes, that is a real cell phone bill that I got with my previous provider, and it's why I personally switched to Ting. And Ting Mobile has three brand new plans to make sure that this never happens again. All of Ting's plans have unlimited talk and text starting at just $10 per month, add data for as little as $5 per gigabyte, or choose a set of data, or just go full unlimited for $45 a month. Switching plans is really, really easy because you can keep your same phone number and use pretty much any phone. And the service is great too because Ting partners with several massive networks, probably the very same one that you're using right now, but at a huge discount. They literally use the same infrastructure. Now, actually, I can't tell you which ones because I always respect contracts, but let's just say that my service hasn't changed at all. And it's incredibly easy to transfer service using the exact same phone number you have right now. You just order a Ting SIM card, pop it in and set it up. You don't even have to call anyone. It's like magic. So if you go to LegalEagle.Ting.com or click on the link in the description, you can use your last bill to compare just how much you would save. And Legal Eagles will also get a $25 service credit that could cover two months of service. So just click on the link in the description and give it a try. Plus clicking on that link really helps out this channel. So do you agree with my analysis? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this other Legal Eagle video right here. I think you're really going to like it. So click on this video or I'll see you in court.